one of the most demoralising experiences in your spiritual journey is church conflict. When I was in my late teens, uh, the church I was a part of went through a split and it was a nasty split. I remember angry words being spoken and church members refusing to talk to each other and even whole families leaving. And I wish I could say that was an isolated event, but it's not. It's been replayed over and over through the history of the church. Some of my most painful experiences in ministry have been people leaving Westside because they didn't agree with the direction we're going or they didn't like the way I handled something or they disagreed with our understanding of God's word. Maybe you've had similar experiences. Maybe a brother or sister said something that deeply wounded you. Or you've had a disagreement that just couldn't be resolved. Or a particular person just seems to have it in for you. How do you keep your heart fully devoted to God when you're dealing with conflict in the church? Instead of doing a topical sermon this morning, I thought I'd focus on Psalm 55. David knew all about conflict. His older brothers question his motives. His best friend's father accuses him of treason and tries to kill him. His loyal supporters blame him for their troubles. His own children turn on him and try to take his throne. Psalm 55 is David's personal response to the reality of conflict. And it gives us a helpful insight in how you and I should resolve conflict. So let's start with the reality of conflict in our lives. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation. And when we think of tribulation, we often think of persecution, how the world hates and mistreats God's people. But the truth is we experience tribulation even in the church. Listen to what David says in verse 12 and 13. He says, for it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. It's not an enemy who David is in conflict with. It's not an outsider. It's his familiar friend, his companion. Usually the Psalms talk about a generic enemy, uh, those people, uh, but, but this is no faceless person. This is someone that he knows, someone that he cares about. This is his friend. He says, it is you, O oh man, who are doing this to me. But then he adds in verse 14, we used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. This isn't just any man, but someone dear to him. Someone who he got advice from. They took counsel together. They encouraged one another. This is someone that he worshipped with in the temple. This is, in our terms, one of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But at some stage, this close friend turned against him. David later says, My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. David doesn't say what happened, but at some stage, his friend became his foe. His companion became combative. What's worse, he seems to have maintained the facade of being a friend with smooth speech and soft words, but his heart was against him. His words were swords designed to wound. The truth is, even God's people experience conflict. Your closest brothers and sisters in Christ might one day turn against you. You may, may have already experienced that in your own life. Jesus says this, he says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus presumes that at some stage one of your brothers or sisters will have something against you. And he tells us in that situation, go and be reconciled to them. Sort out that relationship first. 
Make that your priority. Later, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Again, Jesus presumes that you will experience conflict with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we see in the early church. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, asks, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? He's talking to Christians there. He's asking them, what are the things that are causing you quarrels and fights in the church? Paul pleads with two women in Philippi to agree in the Lord. They're, they're, they're struggling with a disagreement. And Paul says, you have to come back together and work that out. Paul says to the church in Corinth, it has been reported to me that there is quarrelling among you, my brothers. And he confronts that same church for taking each other to court and dealing with their grievances in the public courts. Conflict amongst God's people isn't something new. But not only does David tell us that God's people will experience conflict, but that they do because God's people are affected by sin. He says in verse 9 to 11, I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. David sees violence and strife and iniquity and trouble and oppression and fraud not out there in the world, but amongst God's people, in the city of God, in the church of Jesus Christ. And Paul sees the same. He asks the Christians in Corinth, you are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? The church is not immune to the effects of sin because Christians are not immune to the effects of sin. At the root of every conflict is our sinful nature, our pride, our unwillingness to forgive or to listen, our lack of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I might be so bold, sometimes it's not their fault, sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's my fault. If you came this morning hoping to find a perfect church, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We're not perfect and you won't find one because people aren't perfect. That's a theological truth. But how does that make us feel? Well, David tells us how it makes him feel. He says in verse 6 to 8, And I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. I love that imagery. Conflict in the church makes you want to run away. Oh, that I could just sprout wings and fly away. It's like saying, I think it's time to move to Brazil. I'll go and live in the rainforest. Buy a little, a little uh, cabin up on the mountainside and be alone instead of around these strange people who keep giving me a hard time. Church conflict is like a raging wind. It's like a storm. Church conflict makes you want to find shelter. It makes you want to find some peace. Church conflict is a reality for God's people because God's people are affected by sin and it makes you want to get away as fast as you can. But is that the best way to respond to church conflict? Running away might be your first impulse, but is it a biblical one? Well, let's look at how David responds to his conflict. Well, firstly, he teaches us to be honest about it. Uh, David writes, I am restless in my complaint and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me and in anger they bear a grudge against me. David doesn't sugarcoat it. He says, God, this is what is going on in my life. The, the, these are the things that I'm dealing with. This is how I feel. Because often when we experience these things, we can just sort of hide from it 
Pretend that it's not happening. We just keep going on with life as if it's all going well. But Jesus says, don't do that. Rather, be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and worship. David gets really honest in verse 4 and 5. He says, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. I just want to make two quick comments about that. The first one is, that probably puts your issues in perspective. You know, is your conflict really making you feel like this? You know, or is it not as bad as you think? You know, so just keep your conflict in perspective. And secondly, maybe don't overstate how you feel. Things might be bad, but don't be too quick to proclaim anguish, the, ter- the terrors of death, fear and horror. Um, it's got to be really bad before you get to that sort of language. So what David was going through is pretty full on. Uh, you might have seen a little bit earlier on a warning. Uh, there's some. Re- I decided to cut that out because my sermon was too long. But that warning is there because David is writing as God's anointed one. Uh, he's the king. And when people are, are, are working against him, they're working against God's anointed. A- and you are not the Messiah. So, so you probably can't pray everything that David prays. Don't go pray that God will throw them in the pit of destruction or uh, divide their tongues. Uh, that's the sort of thing that, that God might one day do to these people if they refuse to repent and they reject the Messiah. Where am I now? All right. So that's the first thing, to uh, be honest about the conflict you're experiencing. The second thing David teaches us is to pray about the conflict we're experiencing. In fact, Psalm 55 is a prayer. Uh, David starts, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. David turns his problems into prayers. In verse 16 he says, I call to God. And whenever you see that in the Bible, generally that's a, a statement of need. I call to God because I need his strength. I call to God because I need his patience. I call to God because I need his wisdom. I call to God because I need his grace to forgive. We call to God because he hears, because he answers us when we call, because he cares about us. We call to God because God helps those who call to him. In fact, David doesn't just pray about his situation. He encourages you and me to pray about it. In verse 22, he says, cast your burden on the Lord. Now, he's not talking about me anymore. Now he's saying, you should do this. You should cast your burdens onto the Lord. When you're experiencing conflict, pray about it. Bring it to God. Call out to him. Thirdly, David teaches us to trust God in it. When you're experiencing church conflict, trust God. That's literally how David finishes his prayer. I will trust in you. And David trusts God to do five things. Firstly, he trusts that God will save you. Verse 16, but I call to God and the Lord will save me. Notice the future tense, God will save me. God hasn't saved him yet. He's still in the midst of it all. But he believes that God will. Sometimes when you're experiencing something painful like church conflict, you wonder how God will ever fix this. But do you believe that he will? Do you believe that God will save you in that moment? Secondly, trust that God will hear your prayers. Verse 17 evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan and he hears my voice. Notice that David just doesn't pray and move on. He keeps praying. I prayed last night, God. Prayed for an hour. And and as soon as I woke up, I'm straight back into it. I'm praying again in the morning. Even at lunchtime, I stop and pray about this. And that reminds us that our prayers aren't always answered straight away. And that we have to keep praying for things. But he does say, God hears. 
Your prayers do not fall on deaf ears. Trust that God hears when you talk to him. Thirdly, trust that God will redeem your soul. Verse 18, David says, He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage. Hear the words he uses? I'm in a battle. That's what conflict is. Conflict is when two people are fighting against each other in, at some level. It might be a small thing, it might be a huge thing, but it's, it's, a, it's battling. You're battling with someone. Sometimes we battle with other people's expectations and opinions. Sometimes we battle our own pride or our own fears. David doesn't promise that those battles will stop. But he does say, God will redeem your soul in safety. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Even in the midst of conflict, the Lord will keep your soul safe. Despite whatever it is you've gone through or you're currently going through or you're, you will go through, do you believe that God will keep your soul safe? That he will carry you safely to heaven? Fourthly, trust God will humble your adversaries. David says in verse 19, God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God. Of course, it might be you who is humbled. Maybe it's you who isn't fearing God. Maybe it's you who isn't changing. And maybe God will humble you. Because ultimately, what changes people is that they fear God and repent, that they humble themselves before God, and that changes how they interact with other people. David reminds us that God is the one who sits on the throne from of old. God has seen all this before. This is not new to him. And he is the king before whom everyone will one day give an account. One day everyone will humble themselves before the Lord. Do you trust that God will humble your adversaries? Finally, trust that God will sustain you. Verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. In the midst of the worst conflict, God can and will sustain you. In, when David says he will never permit the righteous to be moved, he means that God will uphold the cause of those who would do what is right. If you're not in the right, God will move you to repentance. If you are in the right, God will help you stand firm. Ultimately, though, our hope is that God sustains those who have put their faith in Jesus. God will never permit his children to fall in the battle. When you experience church conflict, be honest about it, pray about it, and trust God in it. Trust God to save you, Trust God to hear your prayers, to redeem your soul, to humble your enemies and to sustain you through it all. But I want to finish this morning with two things that you need to remember in church conflict. When David tells us to trust God, he reminds us that our God is in control. God is in control of church conflict. Sounds so easy to say, isn't it? But do we really believe that? Do we believe that God is in control of the situation in Ukraine? Do we believe that God is in control of the flooding in New South Wales and Victoria? Do we believe that God is in control when we get cancer? Do we believe that God is in control when Christians are at each other and aren't seeing eye to eye and there's conflict in the church? Let me look at four ways that God works in church conflict. Firstly, God is working for your good. That's what Paul says. For those who love God, all things work together for good. Somehow, conflict, God uses for the good of his people. I'm not saying God orchestrates that conflict. Rather, I'm saying God uses it. 
for our good. Isn't that a statement of faith? If you can trust God to sustain you through conflict, you can also trust God to use it for your ultimate good. One of the ways God might use church conflict for your good is to work on your character. Again, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces character. Being honest about church conflict and praying about it and trusting God in it will produce a more Christ-like character in your life. Church conflict can be a furnace that refines your soul. Thirdly, God may use church conflict to test your faith. God wants to know whether you love him or whether you just love the church. Do you come here on Sunday mornings to actually grow in your relationship with God or you just like hanging out with other people? Sometimes we can love the church more than we trust God. That's a dangerous place to be. Firstly, because the church can't save you. Only Jesus can do that. And secondly, because the church will disappoint you. Because only Jesus is perfect. His people certainly aren't. Sometimes God will use church conflict to test who it is that you really tr trust. Finally, remember that even in church conflict, God continues to bless you. When other people are frowning at you, God is still smiling on you. When your brothers or sisters have turned their backs on you, God hasn't. Like we saw a few weeks ago when we looked at keeping the heart in poverty, even when you've got nothing, you have everything. You might not have a friend in the world, but if you've got a friend in Jesus, you have everything. Martin Luther once said, it is enough that the church's affairs are in good hands. When you experience church conflict, remember that God is in control and that he's using it for your good. Secondly, remember that Jesus is with us. We are so quick to think of church as our church, aren't we? We say stuff like, my church is going through a hard time or, or I don't like where my church is headed. But it isn't our church, it's Jesus' church. It's not your church, it's Christ's church. John Flavel says, no matter how many troubles are in her, yet her king is in her. I love that line, that's why I quoted it. <laughs> Jesus is in us, even when we're messed up. Jesus is still there. Jesus hasn't given up on us. Jesus is still working. Jesus says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And he said that in the context of church conflict. The fact that Jesus is with us has two implications. Firstly, because Jesus is with us, we are motivated to reflect him. Paul writes in his discussion about the church, he says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. The challenge for us in church conflict is instead of dealing with it in a worldly way, instead of getting back at people and fighting and quarrelling and arguing, that we put on Christ in that moment. We're to put on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience can you imagine a church conflict where everyone is trying to outdo each other in being kind, gentle and meek? I don't think it would last very long, would it? If we truly loved one another, there would be no church conflict. You see, instead of loving ourselves, we're to love one another, Paul says. And that will bind everything together in perfect unity. Unity. 
If Christ's peace ruled in our hearts, we would actually function as one body to which we were called. We were called to be one body. And that's how we're to function. Jesus is here. So let's show it in how we treat each other, eh? Secondly, because Jesus is with us, the church will prevail. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against, against it. Hell will not win over the church. Sin and Satan will not defeat Jesus' church. John Flavel writes, Fear not, for as sure as Christ rose on the third day, so also the church will rise up out of all of her troubles. Be not too quick to bury the church before she is dead. Stay until Christ has tried his skill before you give her up for lost. The bush may be engulfed in flames, but it will never be consumed. The church has experienced conflict for 2,000 years and it is prevailed by the power and grace of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you will experience conflict in the church because the church is full of sinful people just like you. And it will make you want to run away. It will make you want to find a different church, a better church. But I want to challenge you not to run from conflict, but to instead pray about it and to trust God in it. Remember that God is in control even of church conflict and he will use it for your ultimate good. And remember that Jesus is with you in it. So reflect his character and believe that his church will prevail. In church conflict, keep your heart fully devoted to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, one of the most difficult things in life is to stay positive when we see the brokenness, not just out there in the world, but even amongst our own spiritual brothers and sisters. Lord, it's hard not to despair and get despondent when we see conflict in our, in our own churches. But Lord, I pray that you would keep our hearts fully devoted to you in those moments. That Lord, we would be honest about what we're experiencing. That Lord, we, we wouldn't be surprised by these things because we know that we're sinners and they're sinners. And you call us to forgive and to work through these issues together. Lord, help us to pray about these things. That we might come before your throne of grace that we might experience your help in our time of need. Lord, we pray that we would trust you in it, that we would trust that you would save us, that you would hear our prayers, that you would redeem our souls and keep us safe, that, Lord, you would change us and others in the process. Lord, I pray that we would remember that you are in control, that your son Jesus is with us through his Holy Spirit and that, Lord, your church would prevail. So, Lord, I pray that in conflict that we would put on Jesus, that we would reflect his character and that we would resolve our conflict to your glory. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.